Thank you. So uh, here's the deal. I submitted this as a lightning talk and got it accepted as a lightning talk, but about halfway through preparing, I realized it's totally not a lightning talk and should have been a full size talk. Uh, but I'm here now, it's too late to turn back, so I'm just going to talk really fast. Uh, writing logs to a file is the easiest form of observability we have and the oldest form of observability and the reason is that it's really easy to understand. As a human being, we write notes on a paper. It's a pretty logical follow that an application writes its notes on a log file. We can all understand that. Now, collecting logs from those files, absolutely not easy. Don't recommend implementing this yourself if you don't have to, but FluentBit did, and I'm going to talk about how FluentBit did it. Uh, that's me, I work at Google on observability stuff. Uh, everybody in this room probably knows what FluentBit is, uh, but my mom watches these talks and she doesn't. Uh, observability data collector. Uh, FluentBit is a, an observability data collector that runs uh, and collects logs, metrics, and traces. You can run it as a gateway, something external that you send data to, or you can run it as an agent directly alongside the things that you're collecting, and we're gonna be mostly talking about that second mode. You're running it as an agent because you're reading logs directly off of your machine, a file on your machine. Um, this is a diagram that I drew for the full FluentBit engine back when I had the luxury of 40 minutes to do an internal talk at work. Um, I only have time to talk about these things, so I'm not talking about anything else down the FluentBit pipeline. That's a whole other topic in itself. I'm only talking about FluentBit retrieving data directly from log files right now. A file log collection solution, in my eyes, has four major problems it needs to solve, and I'm sort of modeling this talk around those four pillars, and that's discovering files to read data from, uh, detecting changes on those files, seeing that there's data to be read, uh, actually reading the data from those files, and handling file rotations. File discovery, probably the easiest section. Um, you might start with a list of paths that the user wants to monitor. These can be relative or absolute paths to specific files or uh, wildcards, and these are in libc glob format. Uh, I think they manually re-implement it for Windows, but for the most part, it's relatively the same thing. Uh, once uh, FluentBit's run through all these, it will have a list of file paths that it's going to be collecting from, but this is not enough information. We need to get information for each specific file. So what we're doing is we're going to call, use the statsys call to get information about that file, which I'll talk about in the next slide, but we're also going to make sure that it is a regular file, because on Linux, devices and folders are also files, but we don't want to be trying to read logs from them. Uh, we use the open syscall to get a file descriptor. We record information that we care about from stat and from other stuff that we can determine from the file configuration, and we uh, store that uh, in a FluentBit specific struct for the file information that it needs to know for tracking progress in the files. And um, we'll save those things in a local file list. This is a hash table that I'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, and optionally, you can store that in a SQLite DB. Uh, that will allow you to track your progress on, on certain files across FluentBit crashes. Uh, the information stored for each file, we have a file descriptor that we're going to be using to read data from later. We have an inode number. This becomes important when we're talking about detecting rotations. Uh, we have certain info from stat that we need to detect changes. Um, we get a hash key for the lookup in the local file table. The lo local lookup is based on the device number and the inode number notably not the name of the file. Again, when we get to rotations, that'll be important. Uh, the current file position and offset. Now this is a bit of a janky setup because the local file struct has the position that it remembers it being at, but also it has to constantly L-seek the file to the position that it's recently read. Um, we also have a local data buffer for each individual file that we're tracking. It gets a local data buffer to store data into when it's reading data. Uh, that starts with the initial size of the buffer chunk size config on the tail plugin. Um, and you can also configure the tail plugin to do parsing or multi-line parsing directly on reading from file. You can also configure it to do as a filter plugin, but that's a separate process. You can instead configure it to happen directly off of the file and that will deal with the, pro the context from that at that, this point in the pipeline. Detecting changes, FluentBit has two strategies for detecting changes. The first one is polling. This ends up being the default on non-Linux systems. Uh, and the polling is the sort of simple way that you would expect this would work. Every 250 milliseconds, you poll the file and see if there's any new data. That comparison is whether the size is different than what we have recorded or whether the modified time is different than what we have recorded. And then every two and a half seconds, we do a more extensive check to detect file rotations. The iNotify version is the default on Linux. Um, you can make polling work on Linux too, you can configure it to do that, but default is iNotify. This is a Linux subsystem that is built for detecting changes from files. Uh, you create an iNotify instance, you get a file descriptor, and on that file descriptor you can read different change events for an iNode that you're watching. 
and you can add a watcher for every I iNode that you care about. And what FluentBit will receive is uh, events like IN modify, saying that this iNode was modified, or IN move self, meaning like this had a move operation on it, or there's a few other op options, but those are the main ones that FluentBit cares about. Uh, so what the tail plugin does in this case, it will create an iNotify instance. It will add a watcher for every file that it's tracking. It will uh, read file, read the file that correlates to the events that it receives on the iNotify instance. Uh, and every two and a half seconds, it will still do a sort of separate from iNotify check for if there's any pending bytes that haven't been caught at the, at the current moment. Uh, and that's a diagram that I drew that maybe I should have just had show up on the slide earlier. Um, reading data from the files, um, let's say we have detected that there's change in a file and we need to read data from it and our offset is here. That means we have this much data that we need to read off the file. We will try to read that into the file's local buffer. Now there may or may not be enough room. If there is not enough room in the buffer, we will allocate another buffer chunk size worth onto that buffer to try and make more room for it. And that goes up to a buffer max size. You want to set a buffer max size to make sure that you're you know, your own local memory isn't constantly going up and up because these are, you know, allocated on the heap of the program. We read that data into the buffer and we update our stored file position offset and we also LSEQ the file to wherever we just read. Processing data. Um, the data is processed one line at a time. So from the buffer, FluentBit will be reading until it receives a new line character, and that's when it will move on to the next step. The log will eventually be structured in FluentBit's internal message pack format. You might be familiar with message pack in other scenarios, but it's uh, basically a format that is kind of like a binary version of JSON. You can represent most JSON objects as message pack as well, but it's much more compact because it's a binary encoding. Uh, so if we just have a simple log line like this and no parsing, it's just going to go straight into a message pack object with one key. You, by default, it's called log, but you can change that key, and the, and the value will be the contents of the log. Um, if you are configuring basic parsing, like JSON, um, we will actually send it through a JSON parser, and the resulting message pack will have the same structure as the JSON we just read. Uh, and finally, if you have multi-line parsing, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, as we read a line from the buffer, the multi-line context will tell us whether uh, it's expecting more lines or not. So like if you're detecting Java exceptions as a common multi-line example, and it's detected this is the first line of a Java exception and it's expecting more, it'll refer back saying we need more lines and it'll go on to the next line. Or it'll, it'll say that it's finished and you'll get in the end a log with all the lines uh, that you care about directly in one message pack object. Rotations. Oh my god, I'm, do, I'm making good time. Uh, <laughs> FluentBit is resilient to two ro rotation strategies. Uh, one of them is copy truncate, and the other one is move. This is in log rotate parlance. But I'm going to explain what they, what they are. Copy truncate. You start with a log. When it's ready to be rotated, you make a copy of it with a new name, and then you truncate the data from the original file. Uh, FluentBit can detect the truncation if it sees that the offset that it has tracked is greater than the entire size of the file, then it follows that you must have been truncated and you reset yourself. Um, but there is no way for FluentBit to ever find the rotated file. The copy makes a new inode. And unless you have configured FluentBit to see the rotated pass, which you should not do because then you'll just keep on blowing up, uh, FluentBit has no way to discover that. And if there are any log lines from that file that haven't yet been processed, FluentBit has no way to ever find them. Move is the other common strategy. Starting with a log, you will, when it's ready to be rotated, move it to the new path rather than copy. That means this is the same inode, but it has been moved, and you create a new file in place with the original name, uh, and that's a new inode. FluentBit actually can remember that inode. It will detect the rotation by seeing that the name of the file has changed, uh, but because it remembers the inode, and presumably the device of that file hasn't changed, it can still remember the file and it will keep it around for rotate wait seconds. That's a configuration on the tail plugin, which is 60 seconds by default, I think. Um, so for another minute, it will keep trying to read any log lines that it hasn't seen from that file, or if for some reason you add lines to your rotated file, those will show up too. Um, after it detects a rotation, FluentBit will go through a process to redetect what I'm, I consider like the canonic file. Like this is the original file that we're tracking. This is the new inode that represents this file that we're tracking. Done. Oh, 20 seconds.